looking at finding values of trigonometric functions, but not from the point of view of order pairs, but rather trig identities in this case. Well, uh, so we know about, we're going to look at the, uh, the reciprocal identities, and well, that's something in a way we already know, because if sine, check this out, if sine is the y value, I mean, it's reciprocal, which is cosecant, it's 1 over y, and, and if secant, is, I mean, if the cosine function is x, it's reciprocal, which is cosine, has to be, um, what's that, a 1 over x. And likewise, cosine, which is x over y, because we define the tangent as the quotient between y and x. So we're talking about reciprocals here. Well, we have the quotient identities, which, again, those are going to take us back to... To, to that definition for cotangent and, co and tangent function. And lastly, well, maybe these are a little bit of new uh, new identities that is for, what's that, um, the Pythagorean identities. And that's because these identities come from uh, using the Pythagorean theorem to get these identities, you know, like, something squared plus something squared equals something squared. So that uh, that depicts somehow the, uh, the trigonometric, I mean the Pythagorean identity. And well, usually the one that you want to memorize, um, it's this one. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals to one. I guess that's one of the most straightforward uh, identities to memorize, all right? However, usually we are required to also know the other two um, uh, Pythagorean identities. The other two Pythagorean identities deal with the relation between tangent and secant and cotangent and cosecant. And don't get me wrong, guys, I have a hard time memorizing these two, uh, but I'll give you a trick to get this. So how about, check this out, how about start with sine squared plus cosine squared equals to one. All right, I'm just gonna use S and C for short because I don't want to write a lot, but the, the trick is, is gonna be the following. Uh, how about, um, uh, how about first divide both sides by the quantity cosine squared. Cosine squared, cosine squared equals cosine squared. Dividing by cosine squared, well, that's going to give us the following. Number one, sine over cosine, that's going to give us tangent squared. And cosine squared over cosine squared, that's going to give us a one. I mean, plus one. And one over cosine, isn't that the reciprocal of secant? That becomes a secant squared. All right, so that's one way to get this, the next the, the second Pythagorean identity, and the trick to obtain the third identity, the third um, uh, Pythagorean identity is by, instead of dividing by cosine squared, divide by sine squared. Well, on the first, on the, on the first term, sine squared plus sine squared, I mean sine squared over sine squared, that equals to one and plus cosine over sine, isn't that a cotangent? So that's cotangent squared. And one over sine, that's actually the reciprocal of cosecant. All right? Well, notice I got one plus cotangent squared instead of cotangent plus squared plus one. It's the same. The order doesn't matter when we have an addition. So really, if you don't want to struggle by memorizing these two identities, that's fine. I think sine squared plus cosine squared, it's pretty easy to memorize. We use it pretty much every day. The other two are obtained by dividing by cosine squared and dividing by sine squared on that, on that identity, all right? Especially when you are on an exam, for example, and you are not given any identities and you need one of these, well, here's a trick, right? Let's look at another example. So we're given the value of a sine function, which is 5 root of 5, five root, root of 5 over 5, and the cosine function, which happens to be 2 root of 5 over 5. They're asking us to find the values of the four remaining trigonometric functions. So here is the thing, guys. Regardless of whether we're given these trigonometric values, whether from a point on a, on a circle, whether this is a unit circle or a circle of any other radii, 
Uh, it doesn't matter because ultimately, if we're given the, this kind of problem in the different presentation, this is essentially the y value of the order pair, and this is the x value of the order pair. And that's from the point of view for getting the values from the unit circle. All right. So I think we, we, we have this information to get the other four trigonometric, trigonometric functions. So we already got sine and cosine. How about we find tangent theta, which is in this case, what's that? Cosine, I mean, I mean no, 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 sine over cosine. So notice we're not relating or referring to any circle anymore, just the value that we're given using identities. That's uh, five, uh, root of five over five over two root of five over five. Okay, complex fraction, divide, or uh, rather multiply by the reciprocal of the fraction in the denominator and see how a lot of the factors are gonna go away, the radical and the fives. And so no need to rationalize anything in this case. That's gonna be then uh, simply one half. All right. What about cotangent? So for cotangent, no need to write the quotient. I mean, know that cotangent is simply one over tangent. That's the reciprocal of tangent. So what did we get for tangent? Didn't we get one half? Well, the cotangent is the reciprocal. The reciprocal of one half has to be two. And that's it. No more reference to a circle, just uh, the fact that we have reciprocal identities, uh, quotient identities, and eventually Pythagorean identities. And in fact, we're not even gonna need Pythagorean identities yet, but we will later. All right, uh, and well, my advice is memorize these identities. I mean, the reciprocals, I think they're pretty straightforward to memorize, and so the quotient identities. And likewise, the one I have highlighted in red. The other two, again, I just gave you the trick to come up with them, all right? And what else, secant. Secant theta, that's the reciprocal of sine, which in this case is one over the quantity root of five over five, which is five over root of five after multiplying by the reciprocal. However, yes, in this case, we need to rationalize the denominator. Okay, and that's gonna be five root of five divided by five root, by root of five times itself. That's simply five, cancel the fives, root of five, final answer. And last but not least, cosecant, which is in this case, uh, hold on, I think I made a mistake, right? I did one over sine, but, uh, but don't worry, how about we change this simply to cosecant, all right? And that's gonna, be, that's gonna do it. I'm gonna do secant then. Secant theta, that's one over cosine, and that's uh, one over two root of five over five. So that's root, uh, that's two, hold on now, five over two root of five. And again, let's rationalize the denominator by multiplying numerator and denominator by the square root of five, which is what we did in the previous, in the previous part. Root of five, root of five. That'll be then, well, five root of five divided by, whoops, Two times of the result of multiplying root of five with itself, that's a two times five. And no need to multiply this to get a 10 because check this out. Check how the fives go away here. And we get root of five over two. All right. So again, I mean, regardless of the presentation, whether we have an order pair on a circle or explicitly telling us sine theta, cosine theta, well, we use, we should get the same result, again, regardless of the point of view. What's next? Let me see, uh, huh. uh, oh, okay. never mind. So, okay, another type of problem. So we are given 
given a given the value of a trigonometric function. It doesn't matter what is. Well, in this case, they're, they are not asking us for the remaining five trigonometric functions. So they are giving us tangent of t, uh, that is 12 over 5. But they're giving us another piece of information. So check this out. It's important to know how to interpret this second piece of information. So, they're giving us some domain here, or some range, well, yeah, but either way, I mean, um, not, well, let's call it a, a condition, not because it, if it's domain or range, we can confuse with the y's or the x values, so no, no, no. Let's, let's just uh, call it a condition. So, the condition is that t is between pi and 3 pi over 2, because check this out, if, if we go, to the Cartesian plane, check what's going to happen. Tangent uh, is the in this case we have tangent as the quotient up to numbers, a positive over a positive. In this case, that's the uh, that's the first quadrant, right? But that's not the only location where the tangent function is positive. Uh, well, this pi, this t greater than pi and less than three pi over two, it's the same as saying it's another. It's a formal way to say third quadrant. All right, that's the third quadrant. That's uh, the window between pi and 3 pi over 2. So in this case, again, we have two choices where tangent is positive in the first quadrant and positive in the third quadrant. However, need to be careful about how we treat the ratio of the numbers that we have here because in this case, check this out, tangent t, which is defined as 12 over 5, isn't that, isn't that the same as saying as a negative 12 over negative 5? Because negative over negative, it's also positive. And in fact, we need this point of view because the third quadrant happens to give us both the x and the y as a negative. So I'm going to go negative 12 and negative 5, and that's essentially like a triangle to generate in this case. Well, that means how about negative 12, negative 5. Well, so they're asking us to evaluate the secant function, not the remaining 5, not all, not all six trigonometric functions, only one more. So it happens that, uh, that, the, that the secant function is, uh, uh, it's simply, oh, what happened here? Okay. In this case, we need to find the length or the radius because in this case, check this out. Um, that's basically a point on a circle, right? That goes 12 units, I mean negative 12 units, and negative 5 units. We need to find the value of r. And for that, what do we need? We need uh, the x squared plus y squared equals to uh, whatever it is. And you know what? Hold on. I don't think we really need to find r because we are already given, never mind, we're already given the x component and the y component, that is uh, negative 12 and negative 5, isn't it? Well, so in this case, they're asking us to find the secant function. So what's the secant function? The secant is the same as 1 over the cosine function. And isn't it true that the cosine function is, in this case, 12? That's uh, 1 over negative 12. Or negative 1 12. Either way. All right. Now let's see. Okay, no, that's for the end. All right. Determine the period of the trigonometric functions. Well, uh, and this has to do with sort of the, what's that, uh, coterminal angles, remember? I think we already talked about it, but we're going to talk about it again. Well, so it turns out that, um, that the cosine function and the sine function are both periodic at multiples of 2 pi. 
Uh, what do we mean by this? For example, if we have, say, let me, and, and let me look at a simple, at a simple angle. Uh, let me, what if I start at pi? What if, I ha what if I, we have the angle pi in radians to make it easy, actually? Well, what if we add one more, one more cycle? So essentially we add what? Two pi, this is the same as saying three pi, all right? If we do another turn, that becomes a five pi. All right, and if we do another turn, we keep doing a bunch of revolutions, we get 7 pi, all right? So in this case, really the angles pi, 3 pi, 5 pi, and 7 pi are, are all equivalent. Well, actually the ones in blue, 3 pi, 5 pi, 7 pi, are equivalent to the pi angle, and that's because it, we, when we do the revolutions, we go back to the same point once again. We get because because of the periodic properties, and in this case, we add or subtract multiples up to pi. We can also go in the negative direction, subtract to pi to get negative pi, negative three pi, negative five pi, negative seven pi, etc. Right? Again, this is the same as saying these coterminal angles. And in general, uh, we, call, we call this a periodic function when we have some function, and it doesn't have to be theta, it could be f of x. I mean, there's other kinds of periodic functions that you will see later in your engineering courses in a pretty cool subject called Fourier analysis, in which you use these uh, polynomial functions of sines and cosines or trigonometric functions to describe signals and, uh, and, uh, and a lot of signals of filters in the electrical engineering um, field and also the design of, uh, of beams in, uh, in the civil engineering and construction. And you use these periodic functions to relate them to the amount of, say, mass that a, that a floor, for example, can withstand, you know? And, well, that's something that you're going to do later, not, not now. Well, and, well, what about it? And there's something that we need to check out really, really quick. Number one, all function, all trigonometric functions are periodic at 2 pi, except the tangent and its reciprocal, which is the cotangent function, which is periodic every pi units and not every every two pi units. And for this, how about we look at the graph using a graphing calculator? So let's see. So, oh, I have the tangent function here actually, uh, but I think I'd rather do the cotangent function because I think it will be a lot easier to see how, mm. how in this case, okay, one over tangent x. And I'm gonna draw the graph of sine so you can see the period for sine, and which is two pi, and the period for the tangent, which is, uh, or cotangent, which is uh, pi. Well, let me just work on the window. Let me get the scales to be, Pi over two each, second pi over two. And let me do this uh, from, from negative two pi, well, let me do from zero, okay, clear from zero to two pi. All right, and the y min, the y max, uh, that's, too, that's too big of a window, let me do negative two to two. Okay, so what are we going to see here? I'm going to see only one revolution, only one cycle of the sine function, and check how the cotangent function completes two cycles at the same time the sine function is completing one cycle. So from here, again, because each mark right here represents a pi over two, that's a pi over two, that's pi, pi three pi over two, and two pi. So from zero to pi, that's one revolution, well, not revolution, only one cycle, because really the tangent function and the cotangent function, they don't, uh, they don't do revolution, they don't cycle like 
like the like the sine and cosine basically bounce back and forth between negative one. No, these functions actually extend to extend from negative infinity to positive infinity, but have vertical asymptotes at multiples of pi. Every pi unit, uh, we see a repetition of this graph. Let me and let me grease the window so you can see this better. So have about four pi. Oh, come on. All right. Okay, that's two cycles of the sine function and four cycles for the cotangent function, right? So every zero of the sine function actually represents uh, a vertical asymptote for the cotangent function. And those vertical asymptotes occur every, every pi units. And that, that's why the period is uh, it's pi as opposed to co the sine and cosine. All right? And as far as the graph of the graphs of the function of the trigonometric functions, we're going to do a lot, a lot on that in the later in the later sections. All right, let's use even and odd properties to find values of the trigonometric function. Well, uh, I believe we already we we also reviewed this part. I can remember if we did it anyway. Let's go back to the definitions for even and odd functions. So a function is even if when we evaluate f of negative x, that equals the original function f of x. And on the other hand, a function is odd. When we evaluate a function with negative x, we obtain the negative of the original function. Did we do this at the beginning of the semester? No, right? Or did we? Can't remember. But still, I mean, at least I would like to review so it makes more sense. And well, a function can be even, odd, or neither when we don't get neither of those. And well, this will be applicable to trigonometric functions. In fact, knowing this, it's going to save us from a lot of trouble when doing calculations, looking at graphs, or trying to describe the graph of a function, because again, uh, the parity of a function, that is, whether it is even or odd, um, that's related to the symmetry of a graph. And re let's recall that a function that is even, it's also um, symmetric. Symmetry about the y-axis. As opposed to a not function, that's a function that is symmetric. We have symmetry about the origin. We will get into this detail, I mean the geometric details, the geometric uh, implications la later. For now, we're just going to use these properties to rewrite sine of negative 45, cosine negative pi. Well, I mean, last time we were discussing about the unit circle, right? And how we go in the counterclock in the counterclockwise direction for increasing values of the angles. So that's, I guess, the most um, the most straightforward way to go about this uh, evaluating of functions. However, we run into potential issues here when we, when we have negative angles. And in that situation, what we did is go in the, in, the clock, in the clockwise direction and try to find the corresponding negative 45, which I believe that was 335 degrees, right? Now, uh, it could be a little confusing, but check this out. Knowing this, even and odd properties, well, since we know that, uh, that the sine function is, is an odd function, that is, Evaluate sine at a negative angle, take that negative sine and put it outside of the function. And that's negative sine of 45 degrees. And now we can evaluate sine of a positive angle going in the clockwise direction. We don't have to go clockwise and try to guess, to do our best guess. And well, it doesn't have to be a best guess in the end. It has to be an actual value. And we know that sine of 45 degrees that's root of 2 over 2. However, all we do is bring down that sign. And same for, let's look at another example. Let's look at, uh, hmm. let's look 
a cosine of negative pi. Well, careful, because the cosine function is an even function. And well, when a function is even, we evaluate that function if uh, we value that function at a negative, and well, notice the negative sign just vanishes, just goes away, all right? So cosine of negative pi, it's the same as saying cosine of pi. And well, from the unit circle, cosine of pi, that's the point, negative one, zero. Cosine is the x value, that's simply negative one. All right, for the last example, letter C, uh, tangent of negative 3t minus, minus tangent of 3t plus pi. Well, here it's a combination of two properties to simplify this guy right here. Number one, we are going to consider the period of the tangent function and uh, we are going to consider the parity of the tangent function. So how about we go back to the period of the tangent function. All right, so tangent theta plus pi, for example, if I say tangent of 45 degrees plus, uh, no, let me, let me say pi over 6 plus pi, well, this is the same as saying tangent of pi over 6, because pi over 6 plus pi is essentially the same angle of pi over 6 if we're using the periodicity property for the tangent function. If we say something like, say, let me just make up a number, tangent of 3 plus pi, that's simply tangent of 3, because that pi at one period makes it fall in the same location so that simply that reduces it to simply three or tangent of three tangent of x cubed for example this applies for algebraic expressions of course and if we add a pi well this is simply tangent of x cubed and that's it right Let's apply this idea together with the parity of the functions. All right, so what, what about tangent of a negative angle? Well, careful, because, and we have it here, tangent of a negative angle, so the tangent function happens to be a not function. So take out the negative. Well, how can we explain that the tangent function is a not function? Check this out. Tangent theta, which is sine theta over cosine theta. Well, what's, what's, the, what's the parity of the sine function? Isn't that an odd function? And what's the, what's the, uh, you know, the, um, the parity of even, of cosine, in this case is even. So we're dividing a naught by an even, actually a negative over a positive, if we will, that's how we look at the even and odd. The odd keeps the negative sign, the cosine remains positive, negative over positive, it's negative. The fact that this is negative, that makes the tangent function an odd function, All right? And also we can see that graphically because that function will be symmetric about the origin, so, but we'll, we're gonna look at that later when we look at the graph point of view. So number one, let's take this negative outside because of the oddness of the tangent function. And well, minus tangent of 3t plus pi, but that's equivalent to saying simply 3t as we did before. If we have that pi, that disappears and we keep the remaining of the angle. And notice how these two are like terms. That's minus tangent minus another tangent that equals to negative 2 tangent 3t. And final answer. All right. <clears throat>